so what will this lecture cover? The, what we'll talk about what the cosmetic gynecology or aesthetic gynecology is, why it's important, um, and what's happening around the world in this field, what the applications are, and the evidence and guidelines briefly. So who practices aesthetic gynecology currently? Okay, so we've got some people, a few. No, great. I'm quite excited to give this talk now because this is really a, a field that is being recognized and International Society of Urogynecologists has a working group which has come up with terminology for aesthetic gynecology that I'll get to. So I'm super excited because this field is now forming and guidelines are developing as the research is coming out to support what we do. There is very little research, unfortunately, in the field, and uh, certainly very little good research or randomized controlled trials available. So aesthetics is a, something that is a concerned with beauty and appreciation of beauty. And gynecology, it's a branch of physiology or medicine that deals with functions and diseases specific to women and female genital organs. So we've got cosmetic gynecology, which is elective interventions to alter the aesthetic appearance of external genitalia and modify the genital organs. That includes elective functional procedures in abscess of pathology with the goal of improving person's quality of life. This workshop today will con concentrate on cosmetic gynecology, but we will touch on a couple of functional issues related to this field. This field goes, crosses over from gynecology to plastic surgery to dermatology. Like today in the room, we have a few gynecologists, uh, and I looked at the list a few weeks ago of who registered, and I only saw general practitioners mainly, or aesthetic doctors, and clearly, Ops and gynes are too busy, and they leave it till the last minute. <laughs> but it's great that they're in, in the room. Um, so this is a diagram developed. It, this is not published. It's still in the review process, but it will be published in the next few months. We are almost done with this document. And uh, this is a cosmetic gynecology uh, chart flow developed by a Yuga and a, a American Urogynecologist Society. Um, and what, I'll just go briefly. So is this procedure medically indicated or does this address a pathology? If yes, it's not considered cosmetic gynecology and it's some type of surgery for pelvic organ prolapse. Or for example, labia minora reduction for discomfort will not be considered aesthetic gynecology. A lot of those definitions are related to ICD-10 codes and procedure codes and what's being reimbursed by insurance companies and medical aids and what's not. And basically, if it's not a functional problem, it's not going to have a procedure code. So if someone has vaginal looseness and they need vaginal repair for vaginal looseness, there isn't such thing. Hence, it's going to fall into cosmetic gynecology uh, de definitions. And it's a process that we are working on to try to move it to the diseases part so we can, the patients can have access to care to improve their quality of life. The quality of care being provided to women generally, it's all unfair and we talk about it a lot, but it's true because you can buy Viagra in the supermarket in UK, but <laughs> somehow treating vaginal dryness is a huge issue and women don't have access to what they need to improve their quality of life. And forget about any kind of sexual dysfunction or low desire, like there isn't a preparation for women in this country that is registered that we are allowed to use, uh, not off-label for uh, decreased sexual desire. So there's lots of issues there that I feel we are progressing on and will improve in 10, 20 years time and you're definitely all at the start of it. Uh, and Alex Bader, who I've learned from, has this 
kind of good description that there is a train and train is going. You can watch the train leave or you can get on the train to move with the train. So you're certainly getting on the train to go with the train because we'll have to be on the train uh, invariably and I'll get to that why. So is the intent to cause injury or psychological harm? If yes, that will be female genital mutilation. So a lot of surgical procedures in aesthetic gynecology, such as labioplasty or some type of um, removal of skin, excess skin in the area, can be classified as female genital mutilation, which is not. And the difference is, if there was a consent, it's not FGM. If there wasn't a consent, then it could be FGM, or it's most likely FGM, which is illegal in most countries uh, in the world. So if there is no intent to cause harm, injury or psychological harm, and it is not medically indicated, and the, ma the patient is making well-informed autonomous decision without absence of any external pressure, it will be a cosmetic gynecology and it may be labia minora reduction or surgical vaginal tightening or other procedures. We divide procedures that we do in aesthetic gynecology into therapeutic options and therapeutic approaches. So the therapeutic options would be reduction, tightening, augmentation, amplification, depigmentation. And approaches would be surgical, energy-based, or substance-based, such as PRP or hyaluronic acid or whatever new things that we are going to come up with. And this is a classification of various procedures that we do in cosmetic gynecology. And I've underlined not neatly <laughs> in my um, hello what we are going to talk about today. So I've left out all the surgical stuff as it's not part of this workshop, and I've underlined non-surgical things. So clitoral amplification with filler, or short, or platelet-rich plasma. We will talk about labia major augmentation with filler, um, and labia major augmentation could be done with fat as well as PRP. Uh, labia majora tightening with energy devices, both radio frequency and laser devices provide such um, treatments. Vaginal tightening, energy-based, and it would be various terms that used around the world for this, which is vaginal rejuvenation, vaginal re revitalization, vaginoplasty. For me, vaginoplasty is not a use of energy-based device. However, this term is used as energy-based uh, treatment as well. So this is just for you to know. Then when someone speaks about vaginal rejuvenation, you've got to find out what exactly are they talking about because it can be anything. Uh, <clears throat> and vaginal augmentation, which can be done with the filler, um, and it could be O-short, G-spot, G-spot amplification, platelet-rich plasma, hyaluronic acid injection, Mons pubis tightening with radio frequency and a genital depigmentation either with cosmeceutical preparations or energy devices, as well as genital brightening, um, which is just another term. This field is new, so the, 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 what you see now in this table is what made it into this terminology document which we worked on last year. But I can already think of a couple of things that never made it there. And some of them we've searched for, but we just found no literature and only advertisements by plastic surgeons or aesthetic doctors doing the procedures, but no actual clinical trials. Um, other procedures, I can't remember why they didn't make it, but they just didn't make it. But the my main reason, there was no clinical trials at all. So just to describe it, you wouldn't be able to. And one of the things that I can think of is um, thread, threading so for vaginal tightening. Uh, and this company that brings threads and they train in them and they do it for the vagina and some people have more experience than others. I think Dr. Eccles might be doing some threading, so I don't have any experience. I won't be able to share any information, but Derm, Derm Africa will have a stand and they sell, I think, apostolis, something like that, threads, and that's used for vaginal tightening as well. And I think 
in Georgia, it's a big market and they do a lot of them. So it, a lot of things depend on where you are. Carboxytherapy uh, is another treatment that I don't have experience with, but I've seen it done. And it's quite big in France out of all the places. So some things is actually local and local expertise is being developed. And when they publish their data, it will be exciting for the rest of us because we may implement it in our practices. So what makes aesthetic gynecology important? Life expectancy, aging. Um, one of my friends uh, was doing executive MBA a couple of years ago and she was trying to tell me that actuarials have worked out that we are going to live till 200 years just now. It's like, that's not possible. <laughs> we are not going to live to 200 years. Uh, COVID has sorted all of that out. Uh, so whoever was calculating can now stop. Um, life expectancy is quite high now. And we know that average age of menopause is 51. It's very different to how it used to be. So now we live in menopause for vast majority of our adult life with dry vagina and low libido. And this is the time when women actually able to enjoy their lives because the kids are bigger, they have more time for themselves, they are sorted out financially. Hence, it's quite important for them to have a good quality of life. So female life expectancy, does anyone know where the highest life expectancy in the world is? Anyone? I know pre-COVID, it was Spain. <laughs> I'm not sure about now. It was Spain followed by Japan, but they're very close, about 86 years of age. So it's quite, and the oldest man in South Africa has just died in October. He was 115 in Western Cape. He's actually from Eastern Cape. So even in South Africa, people live lo a long time. Um, we've gone to this, so this is just something on aging to entertain you. As the cat in the head on aging. I cannot see, I cannot pee, I cannot chew, I cannot screw. Oh my God, what can I do? My memory shrinks, my hearing stinks. No sense of smell, I look like hell. My mood is bad, can you tell? My body is drooping, have trouble pooping. The golden years have come at last, the golden years can kiss my ass. <laughs> so we are here to help <laughs> the cat. <laughs> and uh, I can assure you that uh, the world is working on it extensively. So this is how we now look as we age. Uh, so Gwen Stephanie is 52, Vera Wong is 72. That's my favorite. I just cannot believe that. And uh, Ernestine Shefford is the world's oldest bodybuilder. And I, I show her picture every year. Now she's 85. Um, when you look at those women, you imagine that, OK, them, I'm not sure about Gwen, but the other two are definitely postmenopausal for decades. They're probably having quite a good sexual life, and they're probably not dripping and drooping. <laughs> and everything is working. <laughs> and guaranteed, it does not come naturally. <laughs> so <laughs> our help is needed. And this is another funny slide. Um, so this lady says, my, I met my sister for lunch the other day. She is actually beginning to show her age. Of, no, of course, not her real age. Um, so what do women want? And this is Maslow hierarchy of needs and they used to be quite sim simple, simple, just roof over the head, but actually it's much more than that. But need for physiological needs at the bottom of the hierarchy of needs besides air and food and drink and shelter, warmth and sex and sleep are all important. And as we get to menopause, it's just not possible for that to continue without our help to women. Relationship, 
and aesthetic needs, besides Wi-Fi, of course Wi-Fi is a major, is a first need, but aesthetic needs have made it as well. So beauty, balance, harmony is very important and it's important for women's well-being and not just necessary, like, so it's not just all vanity, it actually has a huge psychological impact and little changes play a huge difference. Women also now know how to get information and they're very well educated. Unfortunately for me, I do a lot of consults which are second opinions. Uh, I'm still kind of a new person here and there. So people find me on internet and they read and they decide, oh, I just want to go and ask what this person thinks about this problem because I hear what the doctor said. I've read uh, internet and it just doesn't come together and no one can answer my question, so they come for second opinions. And yesterday I saw someone who came to me for second opinion for lichen sclerosis, which she diagnosed herself. She then, um, she diagnosed it herself. She also made it much bigger than it is in her head. And she now feels that she's suffer, going to suffer from all kinds of autoimmune diseases just now because that's associated with autoimmune diseases. She went to her gynae. He looked at this thing. He had a laser. He's like, okay, let me laser it off. And I, do, it, I don't think it was lichen sclerosis, but she can never said it wasn't. So they've lasered it off. They sent something to the lab. The pathologist looked at it and said, it's possibly early lichen sclerosis atrophicus. And here you're looking at this patient. She's got absolutely normal genitalia, normal sex life, and she's 65. She's got no issues whatsoever, no vaginal atrophy, no HRT. She's an exclusion from my practice. And she's going crazy because she's, she thinks that she has lichen sclerosis. And she was trying to explain to me, but you have to understand, on internet, I was like, okay, I all understand. She was very grateful she doesn't have it, she left. Uh, and she wasn't the only one yesterday in my clinic with bizarre story of something. And what I'm trying to say is that when you pick up any magazine, you can find a treatment for all kinds of things. Uh, when you, when someone came for all shot because they saw it on Joburg's housewives two years ago. It doesn't mean the o shot is applicable to them. They might have severe vaginismus and they can't even open their legs, but they've seen that that woman was having an o shot. It didn't look too bad and they need to improve their orgasms. They forget that they can't even, like literally can't touch themselves. <laughs> but then now they've read about it a little bit and now they're here to get it. So women definitely have much more awareness of what's going on in the world and what services they can receive. And fashion trends, current fashion trends, they may change tomorrow, but today everything is being removed. So whatever labia looked before, we did not know because no one could see them behind the hair. <laughs> and, and now it's all fully exposed. And even all the ladies who uh, may not have followed the modern trends until the husband died suddenly and they found a new boyfriend and now they decided they're going to remove everything. And now for the first time they've seen their anatomy and they suddenly come to adjust whatever is there. Um, the big thing about this is also, um, I'm trying to find a word, but there's no uh, other word, but like phone sex, video sex. It's really common. And when I run a clinic, there will be maybe 30 to 40 percent to maybe sometimes 80 percent on the day of people who are in long distance committed relationships. And those people all having video sex so everyone can see everything. Hence, now they're coming to once again make it prettier, as they say. And it makes a huge difference to them and to their partner at times, which uh, is another story. So designer vagina or vaginal rejuvenation, I feel like certain people you, I have to mention uh, when I speak about the field of aesthetic gynecology and Dr. Medlock is one of those people. He is a person who actually trademarked term vaginal rejuvenation. He did all the procedures on his wife, uh, who's quite open about it, and it's on all, they had their own like show, 
uh, I'm not a TV person, so uh, I can't quite remember which one, but uh, he, um, he, he himself has a great body, and I haven't got a naked picture of him, but it's, <laughs> he's got six pack going, so she does. And she had vaginal rejuvenation. But this vaginal rejuvenation is actually not what you think. It's not vaginal tightening with a laser device. It's actually a surgical procedure for which he uses laser. And he stumbled upon it because one of his patients who was in his office for something else then mentioned that, oh, there's so much looseness. She doesn't really feel the same after having a baby. And he's like, oh, okay, let me see what I can do. He tightened it up. It worked greatly. She told her friend, next time there were five people for the same thing. Then there were 15 people for the same thing. And that's how he started. And it became hugely successful. However, we all think that vaginal rejuvenation is actually something else. So this is what the original term is. I've trained through ESAC. I'm looking if it's showing now. Uh, so it's um, Eastern, uh, sorry, European Society of uh, Aesthetic Gynecology founded by Dr. Alex Bader. He's from Greece and he practices in London and Dubai. And he runs quite a good structured courses for a couple of days which are theoretical and hands-on. And he actually does uh, workshops in South Africa as well. International Society of Cosmetic Gynecology is another kind of grandfather type of society in this field. And um, that's been founded, so it's Pelosi's, uh, Dr. Pelosi's had, uh, a father and a son who run it. And they are in states, they run courses. Uh, they're probably one of the oldest guys in the field. And they are plastic surgeons. So who else did I mention? Yes, uh, cosmetic physicians, the doc, Dr. Ellenson, he has written a very nice cosmetic gynecology book, uh, which I personally like. Um, he also runs once-on-ones -on courses, so he has five people, or three people at the time, and it's much more surgical base. He is great at using bipolar for cutting and doing vaginal repairs in his office under local anesthetic. Uh, so that's my like favorite. More amygdalas are urogynecologists, have huge practices. Uh, they are partners and they do lots of, besides all the regular cosmetic gynecology, they do also vaginoplasties for gender reassignment and for women with vaginal atresia. So that's kind of their speciality. Uh, interestingly, as I was preparing the presentation, what I found out is that Polish Society of Cosmetic Gynecology has existed for like 20 years, which I could, would never have guessed, but here you go. There's some interesting things that you don't know about that are next door to my country. So we established Society of Aesthetic Gynecology in South Africa in 2018. Uh, I was at a, I think it was a FACE Congress, which has cosmetic gynecology part in London. Oh, no, no, it was an ESAC, actually. Um, and there were a few South Africans who were having tea in the tea break, uh, Dr. Apostolos and Dr. Uh, Josh. And we've chatted and we decided, okay, when we come back to South Africa, we are going to get together and start a society. And we met up a few times in Joburg. Zelka joined and that's how it started. Since then, we've run I think I have some stats there. Um, we run six workshops. Uh, the membership is open to medical practitioners. Um, and we are affiliated with ISAG and with EMCSA. Field of aesthetic gynecology has grown a lot. And this is just data from about two weeks ago. So when you type aesthetic gynecology uh, on Instagram, so all this information is from Instagram, you get 1.4 thousand posts. Uh, and depending on which um, spelling you use, you'll get different number. Labioplasty, 36,000. Cosmetic gyne, 1.5 thousand. Uh, 
12.5 with Americans failing, a vaginal rejuvenation, close to 100,000 hashtags. Designer vagina, 16,000. Mommy makeover, close to a million hashtags. So this is your field. This is what people want. This is what they post. And this is what they're looking for. Vaginal tightening, 44,000. We have a huge number of Instagram users. Uh, the WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook block, block out was a disaster for everyone. Uh, I thought, uh, I was so disturbed, I removed my WhatsApp and uh, only half of it came back. But anyway, <laughs> next day I was missing it. I was wondering, can we not have block out every day scheduled for the whole world, like two hours a day? <laughs> no social media, it was actually quite nice. And so average monthly Google searches in SA. So I started uh, in the field of aesthetic gynecology, as I said, in 2016, 2017. And I did have a marketing team that I've worked with for my gynae practice. And we were trying different things. I had various websites professionally designed by then because actually my gynecology work picked up. So I didn't have time for my uh, IT experiences anymore. And I, I do have a website that I'm not really using, but it's out there called aestheticgynecologist.com, I think, or .coza. And when I started, my team thought I was crazy and the thing will never pick up and no one will ever search for this. So, and you can see, I'll go through the terms and you will see how it's changed in the last four years. But when you look at average monthly Google searches in South Africa, um, in 2019, so the first number is actually 2021. This is done this uh, month. Um, and 2019 is on the side. You can see that it's interesting. Some things are growing in searches. Uh, actually, most of them are. Vaginal rejuvenation seems to be going down, but I'm pretty sure it's because what term you use and how you spell, because a lot of it is about spelling. And <clears throat> Here's a breakdown of frequency of searches in terms of terms on Google in South Africa by the province. And we can see that uh, there is a lot of searches going on in Hoteng. Uh, Western Cape is a little bit behind, uh, but still quite a lot of labioplasties. Um, KwaZulu-Natal uh, is out there and this is others. So the, the others, which would be Eastern Cape and Free State and so on. So our largest surges are of course coming from Hoteng and Western Cape and women are looking for labioplasties and vaginal tightenings. When we look at Google search, and this confirms many stories that you will see in your practice when patients come and they tell you everything, they already know their diagnosis and the treatment and they may have taken the wrong route. Like everyone who comes for an IUD insertion in my practice knows at least 10 stories of how badly it's going to go. And when they leave, it's like, oh no, it like, it's like, don't forget to advertise, please, not advertise, but at least tell your friends that it was fine. So you, they're not scared and like completely traumatized before they arrive. So hey, the basic knowledge is missing because when you look on Google, you find over 4 million search, uh, results on vaginal tightening. That will be with the stones and steaming and creams and God knows what. And on PubMed, there is only 100. And that was in 2019 and it didn't change much in the last two years. Same concerns of labioplasty. So that, for me, this data is scary. We've got to work a bit harder in publishing and actually educating from a medical point of view and delivering that information to our patients and clients so they understand it and hear it from us. So number of clicks of advertised terms, and I only have the information until 2019 because we stopped using this website. So it was vaginal tightening, vaginal rejuvenation. You can see that the numbers have grown tremendously in the three years, uh, just from 2017 to 2019. And they've gone up even more. And lockdown would have brought up certain numbers. Um, as people are at home and they have more time to look after themselves and actually sort out their well-being without going out all the time and forgetting what is not working. Uh, 
number of clicks for advertised terms on my website. So it would be also like this, once again, just to show you how um, changes has occurred in the last four years. So you're on the right train, basically. Aesthetic gynecology is important. Um, and once again, to, to prove my point about women's well-being and us being leaders in the field, having to educate, I think it's our social responsibility to educate people to avoid this. So this woman uh, has got, um, it's almost a million likes on Instagram from a picture of vaginal steaming. I have seen a patient in my office with burns, like terrible perineal burns from vaginal steaming. There is two case reports that I found on PubMed um, describing it. So it's quite serious what people come up with and what they believe in. And hey, they've got a point. They used to, we used to use hot stones to tighten the vagina. That's like millions of years ago. And the whole technology is built on it. Radio frequency and laser is built on increasing the temperature, but surely not with the hot water that has no control over temperature. I will run uh, through um, guidelines quickly. So the field of cosmetic gynecology is new. There have been quite a number of publications uh, and guidelines from various societies, from all societies actually, uh, American, Australian, Canadian, and British, uh, Society of Obstetrician Gynecologists. And the bottom line is that when you do cosmetic gynecology procedures, you have to take, obtain a consent. They should be part of some kind of research and audit, and women should be advised accordingly. If it's a labioplasty, they should be educated about normal anatomy. You can't do anything on women who are younger than 18. Like, that's just not a question. If there is any type of pathology, you've got to investigate it before you undertake cosmetic gynecology procedure. And I'll go on and on and on about it this morning. <clears throat> um, there is, I, I will not stop on all of them. I just wanted to show you that you can find all of those guidelines, but uh, and we'll, I'll get a bit back to them uh, during my practice management uh, talk. So that's done. Thank you.